I'm Kaylin Amadio, your Boomer host and creator of the Boomer's Ultimate Guide podcast. And I want to introduce you to today's guest, Jenny Procopi. She is founder and editrix. There's a word I don't get to say in a sentence all that often. She's the editrix of chronicbabe.com, where she draws on her experience with fibromyalgia and other conditions to teach women to build incredible lives in spite of illness. She tweets, and you know how much I love Twitter, at Chronic Babe, so make sure you look her up on Twitter. She speaks on stage across the country, consults with amazing clients, and wants you to have fun, even if you're sick. For 22 years, the past 11 as an entrepreneur, Jenny has enjoyed success as a writer, editor, and consultant to hundreds of organizations worldwide, helping them craft and share their messages. She focuses on working with healthcare organizations, sharing stories of strength, wellness, and inspiration in the face of adversity. Many young women with chronic illness, especially invisible illnesses like autoimmune diseases, feel that they don't have a voice in the healthcare conversation. In fact, women are far underrepresented in conversations about law, finance, and social issues surrounding healthcare. Jenny's work on Chronic Babe and other related projects is meant to help strengthen women's voices and help them be heard about the reality of life with chronic illness. Jenny has worked with hospitals, pharmaceutical companies, wellness organizations, nonprofits, media outlets, and individuals to give sick chicks a voice. I love that. <laughs> give sick chick sick I can't say that ten times fast. Sick chicks a voice. She loves partnering with other individuals and organizations to create awareness about the struggles of life with chronic illness and the paths to feeling better in spite of it. Jenny, welcome to the Boomer's Ultimate Guide podcast. Hey, thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be with you today. I'm glad that you could take time for us. And I can't say that 10 times fast. Sick, sick. Sick chicks. Sick chicks, sick chicks. <laughs> um, and and I real I this resonates with me this uh, yeah. this cause of yours because my husband has suffered from an autoimmune disease that ha uh. has done um, incredible damage to his heart just by yeah. a fluke mm -hmm. uh, over the last fifteen years you know we've been dealing uh. with it it's not easy yeah. so um, not that not that this is about me actually this is about you well it's but, about us right? <laughs> that's true that it's about <laughs> us so um, how did how did you get into uh, doing what you do with Chronic Babe? Tell me a little more about that, a little more about you. Well, you know, I've been a writer my whole life, a storyteller my whole life. And um, as a journalist, I learned a lot about researching and, and creating, a, giving a voice to underrepresented people. And that was the early part of my career. And then when I was 25, I got sick with fibromyalgia and a bunch of other chronic illnesses. And as a 25-year-old, this is in 1997, most people didn't even know what fibromyalgia was. Mm -hmm. Most doctors were still saying it's not real. Um, you know, I was handed a, a trifold pamphlet and told to take Advil and get ready for a life of pain. That was my instruction from my first physician mm -hmm. who diagnosed me. And I started going to support groups. And most of the people in the group were a lot older than me. They're actually, um, th at the time, they were in their like 50s and 60s. And they were stunned to see a young, fit-looking 25-year-old woman walk into a support group. And they were actually not very supportive. <laughs> I got a lot of people saying, you're too young to be sick, or you look too healthy to be sick. Right. And I'd be so like... So it's hard for them to take seriously. Yeah, they really didn't take it seriously. And I felt really kind of invalidated, and it was a big struggle. So it took me quite a few years to get to where I really learned to accept that I have chronic illness. And that my life is not over because I have chronic illness. There's so much I can still do. And so, you know, service has always been part of my life. I'm a lifelong Girl Scout and a volunteer and I teach ESL and stuff. And so I decided to start a blog and teach people some of the things I was learning about how to really kick ass in my life, even though I was sick. And at the time, this was when blogging was really taking off. And so mm -hmm. there really weren't many people writing about this aspect of chronic illness. So a lot of people would write either really um, bitchy kind of venting <laughs> blog posts, which I understand, you wanna get it off your chest, or they would just write like dr dry medical resources. 
Right. And I really wanted to kind of get in the middle there and, and tell stories about how I was um, overcoming different challenges and how I was creating fun in my life and how I was finding resources or making my own. So that's kind of how I got into it. And then Chronic Babe over the nine years has grown from a little blog to a um, highly trafficked website, a forum with um, thousands of members, a weekly free newsletter where I have almost 4,000 subscribers, a video podcast that I do every week. Um, I don't know, social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, and I have a book coming out in the fall. So it's like, nice. it's become this big empire of chronic babeness, which is really fun. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> An empire of chronic babeness. Empire. No, I like it. And and once again, I, I had mentioned my husband. He, mm -hmm. he was 38, you know, when this happened. Yeah. And I was pregnant with our third child. Mm. And we thought it was one of these things that was, it was going to get better until it attacked his heart, which was unusual for this mm. particular autoimmune disease. doesn't happen very often, mm -hmm. but it permanently damaged the heart. And he's got the heart of a very, very, very old man mm -hmm. at 38. Mm -hmm. In a right? young man's body. Right? In a young man's body. Yeah. So yeah. once again, it was the same sort of thing. We started finding ourselves in cardiac care units, right? Mm -hmm. And having tests <laughs> and doctors, we'd walk in for the first time for an appointment you know, as you start to investigate, what are my options? Mm -hmm. Where's this road going to lead me? What am I going to be able to do? Mm -hmm. And they'd look at him and go, they'd look at the paperwork and they'd look at him and look, yeah, because he was so young. And they're like, right. how, how, why is your heart like this? You know, yeah. it was, and you know, it's been like 15 years now. So it's, mm -hmm. he, he's still a young man, but sure. he's in his fifties now. So they're not quite as shocked anymore. <laughs> right. But I, I know what you mean that they kept looking at him yeah. And thinking, you're way too young yep. for this to be happening to you. And they weren't quite sure what to do with us. So I can, yeah. I can imagine. It's so, it's very, it, you get invalidated and you're already struggling with all these other things with the financial side of it, the physical symptoms that you're having, yep. the emotional turmoil that you go through, your whole community, your family, if you're partnered, your partner, your, your spouse, your kids. I mean, everybody is involved in this process. And yet you're surrounded by people who kind of invalidate your experience. So it's, I, it's a very challenging place to be. And I just really felt like once I kind of figured out some, somewhat how to get around it and how to get out there, I wanted to help other people like me. I just think that it's so important. Right. Now, um, not that it necessarily will be, but do you find mm -hmm. working with boomers to be different in any way? Well, there's a few things that I think are different. You know, y the young women who come to my site and participate in my um, in my chronic babe world in some way, the the young women, high school age young women, teenagers, and then women in their twenties, they're super comfortable with social media. They've got all these resources at their fingertips. They understand how to use PubMed and other online resource tools. They're they're either founding or they're becoming part of really rich online communities where people are helping each other and providing resources and that's just like that's their baseline right that's mm -hmm. where they kind of yeah. start as when I a lot of the boomers and I actually have some people who come to me who are in their 70s and 80s which is amazing to me um, but some boomers come to me and there's a couple things that happen one is that that's not their baseline so they they're kind of catching up Yes. So they're learning how to use social media. They're learning how to do research online. They're trying to get comfortable with the idea of sharing their very personal details with a huge online community. Yes, yes. That's a mind blower for yeah. people who haven't been really actively sure. participating. Um, and so I think that's a big challenge. So a lot of the people who come to me, for example, I have a subscription program that people participate in for Chronic Babe. And part of it takes place online in a private Facebook group. So no one can see the group. They, no one can even see that the group exists, let alone who's in it, unless you're a member. And I have to make you a member. So it's super, super private. And yet I have a few members who don't want to participate because they are freaked out and they feel like there's no way that it can be private. And yeah. I feel like that's a hurdle. And the women who are having that issue are boomer age. Yeah. You know, so I think it's like a comfort level. Yeah, I, I hadn't thought about that but um i i can see it i can vividly mm -hmm. see it because you know I, i've had clients uh who are who are in this age bracket or older like you mm -hmm. said you know even in their late 60s and early 70s mm -hmm. who the whole yeah the whole online thing is scary that's that's it's you know my scary. whole my whole business world you know in my digital yep. marketing world mm -hmm. deals with that but um but that's a big challenge for people. Yeah, I can see that. There's like now. a huge resource that they're missing they're out missing. on if they're not yeah. well, you know, comfortable doing that. And it's yeah. not even just the online chat, but like 
signing up for newsletters, I've had people say, I don't want to give you my email address. Yeah. And it's like, well, I, you know, but I have this free resource I could send you every week and I really want to. Yeah. But if you don't want to give me your email address, so I mean, that's a, that's one challenge that yeah. I see yeah. happening. Well, um, I, I hope, I hope you're listening out there. Boomers, <laughs> right? You're, you, you could be missing out on some really great resources because really resource. you, you have some fear around the whole issue of Mm -hmm. privacy which is probably a whole nother show debatable well oh, yeah. about whether or, or not you actually have no, any true. privacy because i i would um i would say that you probably don't yeah, have any yeah. privacy people can figure out anything they want to I about you i was just talking online. with a physician today about that too because we were talking about you know on the clinical side people's hesitancy to get online yeah. and use social media because of hipaa yeah. and yet hospital systems are using online Ca um, cataloging of pa patient medical records every day. Yeah, so they're like, using the cloud, I'm sure. Yeah, so I mean, like, I go to my doctor's office and he pulls out his tablet and pulls up my yes, medical. Yes, mine record. does too. Now that you mention it, <clears throat> and I really dig that, but I can see where people yeah. have some hesitancy. Yeah. And I guess the big, the big recommendation that I would make on that is that if you know you can do things like if you're really, really scared, you can create a Facebook profile that's not that doesn't have any of your personal information. That's true. But then allows you to participate in some of these groups and you can be completely anonymous. And the same thing goes for forums. You can create an email address that doesn't have any, it's not your name at gmail.com. It's, you know, anonymous human being at gmail.com. Yeah, that you use specifically for, the, yeah. for those kinds of things. Yeah, and if you, you, can take those, you can take those little steps that um, keep you feeling safe if, right. you're, if you do have concerns, but get you into those resources. Yeah. Because yeah. the biggest thing, and this is another thing I find that boomers face when they come to me um, a lot of them and I understand this because I'm divorced a lot of them are divorced or they're widows or widowers or maybe they haven't partnered and they're facing these health issues and they feel very alone yes so I bump into a lot of people women and men who are in their late 40s 50s early 60s who feel like they don't have that support system. Mm -hmm. So I always encourage people not only to look for those online resources because they are really valuable, but also to start thinking about your support system in a new way. So I think about Team Jenny. My support team includes somebody who does my hair, somebody who's my manicurist, my mailman. Uh, my mailman sings every day when he delivers the mail. <laughs> I love that. And how can you not get happy yeah. when your mailman is in the lobby singing like an R&B song and getting all funky with your mail? I mean, it's awesome. So, like, I consider him to be on Team Jenny. And he knows that I work from home. And he knows that sometimes I have trouble with stairs. So, if I have a package, he'll buzz me and let me know. Right. And, like, I start to th encourage people. And I th I, I've started to think about all these people that are in my sphere yes. that help me. So. It's hard because, I mean, I've been through divorce and been through a, a chunk of my life where I was alone with chronic illness. And if I had not considered all those other people in my world as support, I would have felt completely alone. Right. So, I, you know, there's something I t I'm starting to really see in the boomer generation is people who are ending relationships. And unfortunately, a lot of us with chronic illness, the divorce rate is extremely high. It's like twice yeah, what I could imagine. Yeah, yeah, it's so crazy. So... You know, I really encourage people to kind of start building those networks, like make friends with all your neighbors, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> get to know yeah. all the people who live near you, right. um, get to know the, the cashier at the grocery store by name and like start, you know, kind of build all those little connections because those little connections we have with people throughout the day help us feel more supported and stronger, even on our worst days when we just feel like crap, you know? Right. No, I love that. That's a, that's a great idea. And, it, you know, it's about community. Oh yeah. In the for end, sure. that that's what we're always seeking. Yeah. So if you could share um, three tips mm -hmm. for baby boomers, I mean that that was a great one actually. Yeah, oh, thanks. Yeah, well, that, yeah, that's a good first tip. Could you share a couple more tips with us on sure. on what they could be doing? Sure. Well, that first one is that team that team building for sure. Another thing that I really think people struggle with is acceptance. So I um, have given talks around the country about acceptance. It's something I really think is one of the most challenging concepts for those of us with chronic illness or really anything in life, true acceptance. Yeah. So a lot of people will identify with their disease, for example, and say, oh, like people will meet you and they'll say, well, hi, how nice to meet you. And their first thing is I have this disease, you know, and that's not acceptance to me. I mean, that's like, 
you're kind of still a victim of the condition yes, you're right, doing that. Right. It doesn't define you. No, right. Exactly. Yeah. So it, acceptance is really about, it's not about giving up or giving in to anything. It's just about getting real. And so I always encourage people to take time and that's to meditate or to journal or to just get quiet and really get into a, a, a moment of real realization that their illness is like a friend. And it's like, it's like that friend who's kind of really annoying, but they're in your friendship circle and you kind of have to hang out with them sometimes, whether you like it or not. And so you work on, you know, understanding that they're going to be around and handling them. That's like chronic illness. You know, she's your friend who's like, you didn't really invite her to your party, but she's there. So you're going to try to like accept that she's there and be cool and offer her a drink or whatever. And I, I try to encourage people to kind of get quiet and make friends with that illness because then on your really tough days if you can think of your illness as another being right. you can start to feel empathy for her or for him and so then when you start to think about you know there's this girl with who's in pain every day and tired every day and feeling fatigue and having to take all these meds and feeling alone if you can think of her as that friend and kind of catch her eye across the room or maybe go over and give her a quick hug or something you start to feel more compassion toward yourself and my 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 experience has been that you start to come to a place of acceptance you're not you're not being a victim you're not giving up you're not saying i'm not going to treat myself or i'm not going to continue to look for things to help me feel better you're saying this is part of me this is my reality right that's what i was saying this is my reality yeah, yeah. this is because what happens is when we start to think of our illness as the, the, the enemy we start to fight Mm -hmm. And when we fight everything, all that energy, that physical energy, that mental energy, we're like wasting it. We're yeah, it's a lot of it negative away. energy. Yeah. yeah. And we miss a lot of opportunities to connect with people in meaningful, supportive ways, to take care of ourselves in really um, intimate ways. You know, just these basic things. We start fighting against everything and we, we become this angry, pissed off, bitter, <laughs> unhappy person. And then, then we lose ourselves. And you can't win that fight. You can't fight your illness. You're not going to win. And that's a really hard concept because I know I fought for years. You know, I, I, when I first got sick, I, I'm a swimmer and I started, the doctor said, you got to exercise every day. So I started swimming every day and I did it Jenny style, which is like type A, I'm going to conquer this style. <laughs> so I yes. was going to the Y every day on my lunch break and swimming as hard and fast as I could for half an hour with no break, yeah. just power swimming. And I thought, oh, I'm, I'm going to, the doctor said, work out every day. So I'm going to work out every day. And it, it actually made me sicker yeah. because I wasn't being kind to myself. Like I would finish my swimming and I would feel like terrible, but I would think, oh, I got to, I know I got to fight this. I'm going to win. And that's, that's baloney. That just isn't going to work, you know? So acceptance is a big, big concept for people. It's very challenging. And I know that, but it's really worth pursuing. There's a great book called, um, Radical acceptance. I think the woman who wrote it, her, I think her name is Tara Brock, B R A C H. Um, but the book title is called Radical Acceptance. Okay. And it is a fantastic tool for people to check out and try to get into that acceptance zone. <laughs> you know? so, okay, so that's good. So I hear you say build your support circle, mm -hmm. and it do, it's not necessarily anything to do with your family, because mm -hmm. you know, not everyone has you know, family near that's them right. or family at all that they can rely mm -hmm. on. So build your support system. Mm -hmm. Even if it's your singing mailman, yeah, you're part think, of your support system. <laughs> think really creatively out of the box. About right. Who, and, is, yeah. and work on acceptance as mm -hmm. opposed to allowing uh, your disease to define who you are. Acceptance mm -hmm. of the fact that you have it, mm -hmm. but you still have a life. Is yeah. there is there a, a third tip you'd like sure. to leave us with? Sure, sure. The third thing is um, you really got to get organized. Mm. A, a lot of people... And I mean, I understand this. I have a file cabinet over here in my office that is true drawers are full of medical files. And when I started, I was just throwing stuff in a bag. Mm. I mean, I didn't know what to do with it, you know. Yeah. And now my medical system, like all my paperwork comes through my insurance digitally. So everything's online. Everything's in the cloud. I can download stuff to my computer if I want. But what I have found is that over the years, I've had to reorganize myself. So now I'm going digital, scanning all my paperwork. And what happens is 
when people have full lives, they tend to kind of let things slide. And medical paperwork and bills and all that stuff, it's really easy to let that slide. Yes. Because like it yeah, it's no fun to deal with that stuff. Yeah. Nobody and likes the, dealing with it. It is the worst, right? Yeah. But the problem is that will come back and bite you in the butt if you don't get it organized. And there are um, coaches out there who can help do that. There are personal organization folks who will help do it. It might even be as simple as you go to Office Max or whatever, you buy a stack of file folders, and you can organize them by month. You could organize them by healthcare provider. You can organize them by here's my health insurance, here's my doctors, here's my bills, here's my symptoms, here's my charts. There, you can choose whatever way, but you got to get organized because it's going to take a lot of headache f- away from you. And it's going to help all those people in your support team. Because when you're sick and you have down times, like I fell and broke my wrist a few years ago and ha- had to have a lot of extra care, you know, people flying in to stay at home with me. And I, if I hadn't had all my stuff organized, they wouldn't have known how to get my medical records to the right, right. provider right. or, you know, how, who to call if something happens. So I think that it's time to take a day or whatever it means, you know, over the weekend and get organized, get all your files, paper files organized, scan and stuff if you can. Put all your contacts in your phone and do the in case of emergency next to all the people. So ICE next to the names of all the people. So when uh, if there's an emergency, somebody grabs your phone, they know who to call. Right. Make sure all your doctor's names and phone numbers and addresses and fax numbers and all that stuff are in your contacts. Whatever works for you, whether it's digital or print or some combination of both, take that time to really get organized because it's not just for you. It's also for your support team. Yeah, the people who want to be able to help you. And in, ca- and mm-hmm. in case you uh, you were listening but you missed that, she, she said the word ICE, which mm-hmm. is an acronym for in case of emergency. It's a really good idea in your, your mobile device to mm-hmm. use uh, the acronym ICE in front of anyone who is your emergency contact because mm-hmm. um, first responders will look if if you're unable to speak to them yep. they will look through your phone your yeah. mobile device and they'll look for ICE so mm-hmm. in case you didn't know that that's that's another good tip that people might not have realized mm-hmm. so tell me what do you think is the biggest challenge might be one of the things sure. you've already mentioned but what mm-hmm. what's the biggest challenge or concern that you see boomers experience Mm. I I definitely think there's that learning curve and kind of resistance like we talked about to getting online. So I hear from a lot of people, I've had so many people say to me, Facebook is so hard, so I don't do it. (laughs) And I understand, okay, it might be hard for you. You haven't done it before. Maybe you've not worked online or maybe you haven't had a job where you've used a computer a lot. But Facebook is really pretty easy. It is, which is why you're going to want my book. Yeah, <laughs> yes. right. The Boomer's yes. Ultimate Guide to Social Media, That's the first right. in the series of Boomer's Ultimate Guidebooks. That's Go ahead, right. shameless plug. Go ahead. Just, hey, shameless <laughs> plug away. I mean, the, getting getting online like that is such a huge benefit, right? And there are tools like your book and other people. There are blog posts online. There's if you Google how to use Facebook, you're going to get so many different oh. tips. Oh my and, god! Yes. And you know, so I think getting started uh, that's a big challenge for people is just how to get comfortable with it and again I think it kind of comes back to this acceptance idea because I I hear a lot of resistance and it's like this it's like a story that we tell ourselves in our head Facebook is hard or being online is hard or computers are really difficult for me when you tell yourself that story over and over again it's a self-fulfilling prophecy absolutely but the way of the world is online now I mean whether you like it or not you know when my niece was three years old to the choir yeah she was on an iPad I mean kids these days they swipe the screen they think let me do it on the yeah there you go I mean little kids come over and they touch my TV at my house because they think that that's how everything works I've I've made the same mistake with people when I'm like let let me drive that for a second because I have an iPad (laughs) and I try to touch their laptop and I'm like oh wait (laughs) wait I need the mouse wait yep yep yeah so I think, you know, stopping, if we can stop telling ourselves those stories that we can't do something or that something's difficult or it's new technology that I don't understand, if we can stop repeating that old tape, um, that old digital recording, <laughs> yeah. and rewind and start playing a new tape, and the new tape has got to be, there are so many things online for me and ways to connect with people and build a sense of community and connection, I'm going to do it. So that, that might actually be the your answer to my to my next question, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Is if, if someone's sitting mm-hmm. and they're and they're listening to this mm-hmm. podcast or they're watching the video podcast right now and you wanted to look them in the eye and say, 
right this second, this is what I want you to go do to make your life better. <laughs> what, what would it be? There's two things. I'm going to say two things. Okay. The first is that, and this might sound a little woo-woo or cheesy, but I want you to give yourself a big hug. Because oh. anybody who's listening to this, who's watching this, it means they're taking a step to really care about themselves. Yeah. And I love that because not everybody even will take the step to, to watch your video cast or to do for themselves in that way. So awesome. Way to go. You've already jumped a big hurdle. Right. Second step is get online. <laughs> get really active online. I mean, baby step it. Do what's comfortable for you, but don't miss out on this amazing sense of community and support that you can get. Because when, if you're up in the middle of the night with a bunch of symptoms, and you don't have anybody else around you and you're scared and alone, you can get online and find people around the world. And it sounds cliche now, but it's just, it's very true. Yeah, it's not the middle of the night everywhere. It is not, it is not. Right, and <laughs> because of the internet, it, you know, it doesn't matter now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So don't miss out. Those things, yeah. they are life changers. I mean, yeah. I know people who tell me that finding their online community has literally saved their life. So yeah. why miss out on that, you know? Yeah, I, I believe it. So what is the best way for people to get in touch with you? Ah, well, you know, my website is at chronicbabe.com. So that's right. C-H-R-O-N-I-C-B-A-B-E, like you are a babe, even if you're a sick chick. Right. Exactly. And then uh, at, at chronicbabe.com, you can sign up for my free newsletter that goes out every week. There's tons of blog posts. I have almost 40 videos now um, that you can access at the website. And that's a great way to get started because you can sign up for my newsletter and then you're going to get announcements. Like when my book comes out in a couple months, you'll get an announcement about it. If there's a new video up about a concept or a, que a question I answer, you'll get you'll an email. You'll let us know. Okay. And I send all Perfect. kinds of freebies out too. Like every few months I create a free resource, like a PDF, and I'll send a link out to that too. Okay, perfect. So you'll want to visit chronicbabe.com, even if you're a guy. Oh, yeah, you we have lots of You can visit chronicbabe.com, and you can, you can um, meet all the other babes. I mean, That's how good is that? True. We do have an online forum where people chit-chat, so you never know. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, so that is perfect, chronicbabe.com. And would you like to leave us with a final thought, an inspirational quote, an inspirational story, something sure. that we can sure. walk away with? Sure. Well, okay, so I'll try to lean into the camera and get this right. I have this tattoo on my arm. Ah. Oh, it's backwards, I guess. It says, Peace is Every Step. Um, Peace is Every Step is the name of a book that I really love by this Buddhist teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh. And the concept really applies and really applies to people with chronic illness. You have a choice every step that you take. Every minute that you're alive, you can choose peace. You can choose acceptance. You can choose to love yourself and care for yourself. It's, it really is your choice. And I know that when we get sick, we lose a lot of that feeling of control over our lives. Mm -hmm. We feel like it's, we don't know what's happening. There's all these other people. What, yeah, what's you feel like a victim. Yeah. Totally. And I actually, I put this on my arm because I have such a hard time remembering it. That's how badly I want to get reminded yeah. every day. Yeah. We have a choice every day and we can choose to really love ourselves enough to learn how to really kick ass in spite of being sick. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Um, and if I went out and got a tattoo, I think my husband would be very mad at me. He's of that generation, <laughs> but I, but I get it. I, I actually, I just had this whole conversation with a bunch of young people yesterday at a, at a barbecue, young family members. I like tattoos. I think they're cool. But my husband's like, oh no, you don't. <laughs> There's another boomer thing. There's that, that generational thing again. But Jenny, Jenny Prokofi, uh, the chronic babe. And don't yeah. forget Twitter, at Chronic Babe, and okay. visit her at um, her website, chronicbabe.com. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to oh, come on you. the Boomer's Ultimate Guide podcast. Oh, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. It was wonderful to meet you. I hope you out there found this information absolutely inspiring and helpful to you. And until next time, we'll see you on the next episode. Take care. Bye. You've been watching Boomers Ultimate Guide TV, the place where baby boomers like me and like you can come together to learn, share, and grow a thriving business and vibrant life. See you next time.